if you still have one here, and they're not in this room, and they may be in the same room, please make sure they're all gone. Wherever. I guess they're out there. All of them should go home. I hope you'll feel free to do that. But the, the other announcement today, and I think it's just such a wonderful joy, is that just before the service, Mr. Snyder informed me that today is his 35th anniversary on Inglewood's Church.
through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <coughs>
Christmas stories. Can you hear me so I don't have to use the mic? All right, I'm using my Boy Scout camp voice. <laughs> the story is called Why Christmas Trees Aren't Perfect. They say that if you creep into an evergreen forest late at night, you can hear the trees talking. If you listen very carefully to the whisper of the wind, you can hear the older pines telling the younger ones why they will never be perfect. They will always have a bent branch here or a gap there. But long, long ago, all evergreen trees were perfect. Each one took special pride in branches that slowed smoothly down from pointed top to evenly shaped skirt. This was especially true in a small mountain kingdom far beyond the Carpathian Mountains in Europe. Here the evergreen trees were the most beautiful of all. For well, here the sun shone just right, not too hot, not too dim. Here the rain fell just enough to keep the ground moist and soft, so no tree went thirsty. And here the snow fell gently every day to keep each branch fresh and green. Each year at Christmas, the Queen's woodsmen would search the royal evergreen forest for the most perfect, most beautiful tree. The one fortunate enough to be chosen would be cut on the first Sunday of Advent and would be then carefully carried to the castle and set up in the center of the Great Hall. In honor of all the Christmas reigned in honor of all the Christmas celebrations. So out in the hushed forest, every evergreen hoped for this honor. Each tree tried to grow its branches and needles to perfection. All of them strained to have the best form and appearance. One tree small pine grew near the edge of the forest and promised to be the most beautiful of all. As a seedling, it had listened carefully to the older trees who knew what was best for young saplings, and it had tried so very hard to grow just right. As a result, everything about small pine, from its deep sea green color to the curling tip of its evenly spaced branches, was perfect. It had, in fact, already overheard jealous whispers from the other trees but it paid them no attention. Small Pine knew that if one did one's very best, what if anyone else said didn't really matter. One cold night, when a bright full moon glittered on the crusty snow, a little gray rabbit came hopping as fast as he could into the grove of evergreens. The rabbit's furry sides heaved in panic. From beyond the hill came the howling of wild dogs and the thrill of the hunt. The bunny is eyes wide with fright, frantically searched for cover. But the dark, cold trees lifted their branches arctically from the snow and frowned. They did not like this interruption of the quiet evening when growing was at its best. Faster and faster, the rabbits circled as the excited howling of the dogs sounded louder and louder. And 
Then Small Pine's heart shuddered. When the terrified rabbit ran near, Small Pine dipped its lower branches down, down, down into the snow. And in that instant, before the wild dogs broke into the grove, the rabbit slipped under Small Pine's evergreen screen. He huddled safely among the comforting branches while the dogs galloped by and disappeared into the forest. In the morning, the rabbit went home to his burrow. And Small Pine tried to lift his lower branches back up to their proper height. And he strained and he struggled, but the branches had been pressed down too long in the night. Oh well, Small Pine thought, no matter. Perhaps the woodsman won't notice a few uneven branches near the ground in, in a tree that's so beautiful. Several days later, a terrible blizzard lashed the land. No one remembered ever having so much wind and snow. Villagers slammed their shutters tight while birds and animals huddled in their nests and dens. A brown mother wren had become lost in the storm. With feathers so wet she could barely fly, she went from one evergreen to another looking for shelter. But each tree she approached, feared the wren would ruin its perfect shape and clench its branches tight like a fist. Finally, the exhausted wren fluttered towards Small Pine. Once more, Small Pine's heart opened and so did its branches. The mother wren nestled on a branch near the top, secure at last. But when the storm ended and the bird had flown away, Small Pine could not move its top branches back into their perfect shape. In them, there would be a gap forever. Days passed and winter hardened. The packed snow had frozen so far that the deer in the forest could not reach the tender ground moss which they ate to survive. Only the older, stronger deer could dig through the icy snow with their hooves. One little fawn had wandered away from his mother and now was starving. He inched into the pine grove and noticed the soft evergreen tips. He tried to nibble on them, but every tree quickly withdrew its needles so the tiny deer teeth wouldn't chew them. Thin and weak, he staggered against small pine. Pity filled the tree's heart and it stretched out its soft needles for the starving fawn to eat. But alas, when the deer was strong enough to scamper away, small pine's branches looked very ragged. Small pine wilted in sorrow. It could hear what the larger, still perfect trees were saying about how bad it looked. A tear of pine gum oozed from the tip of a branch. Small Pine knew it could never hope for the honor of being the Queen's Christmas tree now. Lost in despair, Small Pine did not see the good Queen come with her woodsmen into the forest. It was the first Sunday of Advent, and she had come to choose the finest tree herself, because this was a special celebration year in the history of her kingdom. As the royal sleigh, drawn by two white horses, slowly passed through the forest, her careful eyes scanned the evergreens. Each one was hoping to be the royal choice. When the queen saw a small pine, what such an how could such an ugly tree, with so many drooping branches and gaps, be allowed in the royal forest? She decided to have the woodsman cut it to throw away, and not for the sleigh to move on. But then, she raised her hand for the sleigh to stop and glanced back at the forlorn little pine. She noticed the tracks of the small animals under its uneven needles. She saw a wren's feather caught in its branches. And as she studied the gaping hole in its side and its ragged shape, understanding filled her heart. This is the one, she said and pointed to Small Pine. The woodsmen gasped, but they did as the queen commanded. To the astonishment of all the evergreens in the forest, Small Pine was carried away to the great hall in the castle. There it was decorated with shimmering silver stars and golden angels, which sparkled and flashed in the light of thousands of glowing candles. On Christmas Day, a huge yule log blazed in the fireplace at the end of the great hall. While orange flames chuckled and crackled, the Queen's family and all the villagers danced and sang together around a small pine. 
And everyone who danced and sang around it said that small pine was the finest Christmas tree yet. For in looking at its drooping branches, they saw the protective arm of their father, or the comforting lap of a mother. And some, like the wise queen, saw the love of Christ expressed on earth. So if you walk today among evergreens, you will find along with rabbits, birds, and other happy living things, many trees like small pine. You will see a drooping limb which gives cover, a gap offering a warm resting place, or branches ragged from feeding hungry animals. For as have many of us, the trees have learned that living for the sake of others makes us most beautiful in the eyes of God. Let us pray. Would you repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for Christmas trees. And thank you for us. Thank you for making us not perfect. Help us to become more like you. Amen.
one thing we have got to see. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a day. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people are you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed in its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, and a home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote, you with the wisdom that God gave him. The word of the Lord. The Gospel reading from Luke 2, verses 23 2 through 4. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they also sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul, too. And there was a prophet, Anna, a daughter of Benil, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At the moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's share together in a word of prayer. Almighty God, you know what has been in my heart as this day has approached. But I ask, Lord, that if, if your will is uh, of something else, if someone here has need today, or if you need to sweep the preacher aside and give you a perfect word of your Holy Spirit, Lord, come, let me come. In Jesus' name. What an exciting thing it is for me to be um, up here with two of my, I have six grandchildren in the room, but, but Alex and Morgan, that you have sure seen me worship many times, in many ways, um, are, you know, helping me today, what a joy that is. Alex was the first a young person who called me grandma, so that makes it pretty special, and, and I'm very proud, and I'm proud of all my grandchildren, we're in Ohio instead of in Florida, because we have uh, 12 grandchildren living in this area. And, and it's an incredible mercy to get to be with them so much and to enjoy them. But a great joy to have so many of you here this morning to participate in worship. And I am going to see who falls asleep. I'm watching this. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm a retired pastor from the United Methodist Church in Florida. And I've been taking a while as we became a part of this congregation to watch the differences between Methodists and Presbyterians. And, and there are quite a few. Um, but we're enjoying this congregation very much. We are just blown away. I mean, we 
Casey Firm, uh, what Mr. Snyder does, and all the directors of all the children's choirs, and what Aaron does, and what the majority is. But our final decision to be here um, not only was grandchildren, but because both of us realized that if we had a need, if something arose in our lives of such a nature that we needed to have a pastoral presence in our lives, uh, both of us could go to your pastor, to Pastor Carlisle. And the, the old thing I've heard from lay people so many years and didn't really understand, we were able to say to him, you could be my pastor, you know, and, and I can let you into that. And I had no idea. People have said that to me for years, that they were looking for a pastor that they could let be their pastor. I'm very thankful for John Carlisle, and I know that you are as well. I have, I have preached in 84 Sundays. <laughs> and, you know, I said to everybody when I left the ministry, I didn't really want so much to leave the ministry. I was tired, maybe approaching burnout a little bit. I've been there 11 years, and um, I have several medical conditions which required me to take disability. Um, so I had to step down. The three services were too many, and it was just, it was, it was before I said from the beginning, I'm really going to miss preaching. And I have found that true. And then I've been asked, what are you going to miss the least? And, and I say preaching. Um, because it's a great, incredible blessing. It's what I was called to ministry to do. But it's also a great burden. And it weighs on you to give birth to this process every week. And, but, but I've been keeping track of sermon ideas, you see. <laughs> I've got 84 weeks. <laughs>
is 
come to a communion table and you get ready to go through the liturgy, there are, there are two important parts there that have to do with this. And the first one is from Luke 22, where Jesus says, Do this in remembrance of me. Is it on that altar? See it there. Okay. Every church I've been in has something near that altar that explains to you what you're there for. Do this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. But to do it in remembrance is to cast into the future the reality of what that meal means. We say the second thing, the memorial acclamation. Christ has died. Remember how it goes? Christ is risen. Christ is alive again. We proclaim his death until he comes again. Because we live not in a, a, a memory that goes backwards, that looks at Jerusalem, that looks at a city not forsaken. We remember forward. And the older I get, the more forward I think. You know, I, I know I'm not going to be there, but I do wonder what, what my eternal life is going to be like. In 1999, John and I had only been married two years. His dad was terminal in Cambridge in a nursing home. We came up to see him and were lucky enough to be with him for a while before he died. And I was in the room with him. I, don't, I had no idea who else was there, but I kind of leaned over him. You know, he was coming and going. You know how it is when you're dying of cancer from the, the medication. And uh, he was kind of coming and going. I said, Dick, how are you doing? He said, I'm great. I can see heaven. And I, it just pierced me. I said, does it look? He looked at me absolutely perplexed, like I was unwell. Um, and he said, don't you know? Him? No, I don't know you. I imagine what I'll do, because so much of my earthly existence is tied up with doing things, when all I may do is just, you know, look at the feet of Jesus. No, I don't, I don't know. I bury good friends and do I know what they're doing? No. Do you know what you're going to be doing? No, we don't know. But here's what we do remember forward. We remember Christ goes before us. John 14, what does he say? That we say so often at funerals, I go before you to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you to myself that you may be where I am. Because that remembrance forward is so critical to our faith and our understanding. I fell in love in 1999 with Chelsea Christianity, and I've been a student of it for a long time. So far, none of my grandchildren have let me tell them anything about it. But maybe one day, some of them will ask questions about the stuff in our house and, and what I have learned from that. But one of the things that just incredibly touched me from day one of studying Celtic Christianity was that every single thing was a blessing. There was a blessing for everything. I've got a book about this thick, the Carmenica Fidelica, for punching open the cow, for punching down the dough, for cutting the wood, for repairing the brakes on your truck, which my son-in-law had to get done this week, for whatever it is that needs to be done in this life, for working at AEP, for playing the organ, for being liturgist for your grandma, even though you might not have wanted to be. But whatever it is, there's a blessing for it in Kelsey Christianity. But there are always blessings that go forward. You know, Lord, bless this cow as I milk her today and keep her healthy that she may continue through her gifts to our community to serve you. The cow serves God. The deer serves God. Everybody and everything they do serve God. And that creates such an enormous presence of forward memory. Everywhere. And it goes on and on and on. 2012 is the unknown too. You will have losses or gains, perhaps. Right now, you wish each other a happy new year. And you do it with whole hearts. Everybody wants only good for everybody else. And if you, if you didn't want only good for everybody else, what kind of stinker would you do? But... But that's what we want for each other, isn't it? It's what we want for all of you. I know your pastor prays that for all of you. But the truth of the matter is that in 2012, there will be losses. There will be worse than these things of medical diagnoses. There will be biopsies that come out good and some come out bad. There will be disasters and relationships that aren't fixable. There will be struggles and hardship and, and diminished capacities. Man, I used to do all day what it takes me all day to do now. And I know it's getting faster. There will be changes in our perceptions of the world and, and some of those things we have absolutely no control over. There will be a, a continuation, at least for a while, we know of the, the miasma, you know, just hanging dark smelling stuff that is the economic depression that our community lives in. Those things are happening. But here's what I know about Christ will go before you. Christ will go before you into joy. Christ will go before you into sadness. Christ will go before you into whatever it is you face in 2012. And you don't have to worry about what it will bring. Because in all things and in every way, you can remember forward. There's the glory of Christ present in your lives. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. I pray you'll stay.
stay long enough to do the benediction before you read because I have something to give you in that benediction. And perhaps might help you visualize how that might work. And if I, can. I pray that in the year 2012, you and all of yours know that Christ is with you, around you, present to you in every single way, and is your Savior, and will take you home, and is going to be victorious on whatever it is in your life, good or bad, that happens in 2012. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us have the same thing. 44. <coughs>
Thank you.